Uh, yes, uh, Archaeology is such a beautiful album. It, I, it is, it's just wonderful. Yet I, I, I haven't met anyone who's ever even heard of it, and I was wondering if it hasn't gotten any attention. Well, I keep asking the record company, but they don't give me any attention. <laughs> I don't know. I, did, uh, I, I think so, because um, it's around in the shop still, and I know amongst you know, people that I work with, I'm surprised that you know, I don't know everybody, um, <coughs> but I meet people for the first time, and they say, oh, I've got archaeology. So it's, 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 that's really nice, because I, mean, I really wanted that album to be kind of a kind of, uh, after John business in 1980, you know, I really wanted to do it, um, you know, kind of my little tribute to the music, given that, you know, people were giving me signals that they really liked the first album as well, which I was unaware of until, you know, the mid-90s, and uh, so that's how it came about, so yes, it has, has been, and I'm, and I'm really pleased, because my connection with the music of the, with Through the Ruffles, you know, uh, has been a labour of love, really has, because I haven't had seen a penny for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, yes, but I mean, uh, to, to write the songs, it was a labour of love, a genuine labour of love, true admiration for the Beatles music, and all I had to do was write Beatles, Beatles music and, and leave out the originality and inspiration. <laughs> I think, the, I, think the, I think the music is fabulous, and I love the art album. I listen to it every day because we're editing it into the new show. Obviously, we have a nice, he doesn't know that, but we have a nice new soundtrack for our show. And it's, it's really fabulous, and I think what happens is a very interesting thing in the brain. You, you, hear, you hear the original sound in your head, and then you hear which way Neil's gone with the melody, and it, it does wonderful tricks. It plays very nice, so it is literally witty music, and I think that's very unusual. And, and, and I think Mozart did it a few times. I think, you know, don't mean to blow smoke up your ass entirely, Neil, but <laughs> I, I think it's genuinely witty music as well as being very beautiful. Some of the songs are just, I think, almost as good. I mean, I, I, as good as I could hear a lot of the music. <laughs> Ricky, you want to talk about working on archaeology, forming the group, coming back? Um, God, Neil. I'm the quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hadn't seen this guy for 15 years, and when he turned up at Gatwick, beaming with a big box with his racing bike in it, it was lovely. And, uh, and, and of course, playing with the hard man, as we dubbed him, Barry Wong, uh, John Halsey. Because, in fact, the Ruffles have ended up as two drummers and a rhythm guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you know, but I mean, we had lots of help on the thing, and Don Altman again did some more arranging on archaeology. I've worked with John for years and years. He was involved in the Innis Book of Records. And, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah and, um, and, and we did, you know, some of the tracks we did for Rutland as well. I mean, we've, we've really been in harness for many, 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 many years. I should also mention there's a very interesting Saturday Night Live when Eric comes back, you're doing a telethon. And Neil, you do cheese and onions in the white suit. You also do a version of Shangri-La, which you then adapt yeah, for the rubble. Yeah, rubble. exactly. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I, I, it took me a little while to get into my head around the idea of doing another Russell album. Because, you know, I mean, in 1978, when we did the first one, it was all good fun. You know, as I say, like a semi-official bi biography, where, but really lying through your teeth. I mean, Mick could lie through his teeth, and so could uh, Paul Simon and everybody else knew exactly what to do, didn't they, you know? Um, but after, you know, um, you know, after, after 1980, you know, I mean, where's the fun in that if you go too closely to the Beatles story? So I, I did, I went down to see George Harrison, and I said, well, what do you think about, you know, doing some more Ruffle things? And he said, straight away, oh, which one of you is going to get shot? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's hard Beatle humour, you know. Um, but I, I played him some of the songs, and, and he was sort of trying to think, um, well, oh, what's this one like? You know, because the first album obviously had to be a kind of soundtrack um, signpost, you know, it needed ouch, it needed piggy in the middle, it needed sort of very, kind of, the sort of thing that attracts lawyers. <laughs> But the second album, you know, I was playing him some of the songs, and he, said, he went, hang on, these are your songs, you know. And I said, yeah. So, like, uh, I'm a clan of middle class of music. Yeah. He said, well, don't be shy, you know. So, so uh, you know, George was very encouraging.
Okay, we have a question right here and right here, and then one way in the back. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know who did the animation for the yellow submarine sandwich sequence. Oh, that was my friend Tony White. Um, he did a terrific job on it, didn't he? I mean, he didn't even know anything. He's wonderful, because we were all too busy making everything else and said, well, what have you got? And Wow, <laughs> it wasn't bad yeah. at all. And of course, he actually, like just about everybody else connected with animation in London, had worked on the Yellow Submarine. <laughs> so um, he knew all about it from the inside. And uh, so, yes, it was, I, th I thought he did an incredibly good piece of work on it. It was beautiful. Yes, back there. I had a question about the music. Um, I was wondering, were there any, ever any legal difficulties involving any of the songs? I mean, I, none of the songs were really outright parodies, but, but a few of the melodies came pretty close. I was just, I was wondering about that. Well, do you want to talk about this or do you want an intervention? <laughs> <laughs> it was claimed. Yeah, I can remember at the time, you know, that, um, you know, the, the people who were then publishing Northern songs, I think it was ATV. ATV, Lou Greed. You're great. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they sort of, you know, said, hang on, you know, you, you, you plagiarized the Beatles. And I said, no, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> this, this sort of went back and forth. And then they got a musicologist in and who, who answered it and um, said, you know, pointed out the melody lines were different. Um, the, the lyrics, of course, were different, and, and there's says no case to answer, no case to go. Well, on and on it went, and halfway through, the chap was getting a bit fed up with all this. He started having a bit of fun by suggesting, I, su I suggest that, oh yeah, and um, all right, are in the public domain. <laughs> But uh, no, I never, they, they, yes, it, it, it's a funny world. It's a funny world. <laughs> they did take it, didn't they? They, they took fifty percent of the. Yeah. Of they the, wanted ninety percent. They wanted ninety. They took, settled for fifty percent. Yeah. And I tried to cheer Neil up by saying, "Look, look on the bright side. These songs are now credited as Lennon McCartney Innes. <laughs> <laughs> How bad can it be?" Well, they they know as well. <laughs> as we know, Jermaine Jackson now owns half of it. <laughs> Okay, I have a question over here. Hi. Uh, we saw some of the great stuff that made the cut. What's some of your favorite stuff that didn't make the cut? Wow. What, I mean, I don't think anything didn't make the cut. They're on a very low budget. Yeah. Everything was in there. Do you remember cutting anything? Do you remember anything? <laughs> I remember very little. <laughs> no, no. I don't no, I'm sure. You know, there was a, the, I don't know what were the stuff he found in the warehouse. with the bits were oh, the no, the outtakes. That go on. The outtakes, the outtakes is on. kind of is kind of interesting. The only thing, the only thing, that's, there's, there's some really nice things, which are the original performances where we all go on stage and we film some songs. And there's an entire song which I like very much called Blue Suede Schubert, <laughs> um, which uh, we sing and perform, which is nice. Um, anybody? I can't remember what else. There's, there's some. There's some nice little press conference outlines and bits and pieces. There's a there's a dreadful joke, um, which is on a sort of uh, an airline a luggage carrying thing, which you you think we're on a train or something, and it pulls out. We're just on this luggage, which is almost as bad as a rattle jo a beetle joke, really. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know because there uh, were some things Danny did that were, you know what I mean. That maybe. Oh, there was a lot of Bill Murray, the K. Yeah, that's, that's what right. I there found. Was a lot some, of that yeah. stuff. He, yeah. he improvised a lot. Some great stuff in there. But, yeah, you know. he was very keen. Bill Murray. He was his first season on Saturday Night Live. Right. He was anxious to replace Chevy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he which he did very successfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Got a question right here. Yes. Uh, you have a. <clears throat> Michael Palin uh, did a great job in it, and George Harrison as well. Were any of the other Beatles or the other Pythons asked to be involved in it prior to uh, shooting? Um, no, not actually. Uh, I'm not, not for any particular reason, except, you know, if everybody gets in it, then it becomes a, you know, a Python show. And it really isn't. It's a sort of, 
It's our, it was our show after Rutland Weekend Television. You know, it was a melange. Um, I well, I mean, it, yeah, it, was a, it became a Saturday night. Like, it did become a yeah. merger, hands across the water, yeah. job, didn't it? Yeah. With Admiral Halsey. <laughs> <laughs> Have a question back there. Yes. Oh, I was wondering if the. Uh, she doesn't need a mic. <laughs> I'm wondering, Neil, when you start to write some of these songs, do you start with, uh, without exposing yourself to any legal problems, do you start with a, a Beatles song? Do you start with the intent of parodying something specific? No. No, no. I mean, really, I mean, I... I but, <laughs> you see, we did that thing in Rotten Weekend Television. I thought that would be it. You know, then we go and do the Saturday Night Live thing, and the next thing we know is, hey, we can do the whole story. And I said, oh, I'm watching this, you know. And so they, they look around to me and... Well, can we have 20 more Ruttle songs by Thursday last time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, well, the one, thing, one thing I did know was if I started listening to Beatles songs, I'd be screwed completely, you know, because you'd just get lost in it and you wouldn't know where to go. So I, I literally tried to think of little landmark moments in my life where I heard certain kinds of Beatles stuff with a mouth organ early stuff or then whatever. And... I tried to think myself back into those uh, situations. The, the hardest ones were write, to write where I hold my hand and, you know, between us and the, the little love songs, really, because they're more straightforward, you know, proper Tim Pan pop songs. I get it. <laughs> I think it's the Beatles uh, lawyers. <laughs> I've just heard about archaeology. <laughs> but, um, there was, uh, uh, to take your point more seriously, I mean, yes, I, I did realise, you know, that, well, that will do because that can have that kind of thing. And if anything, the Ruffles music does, it really steals a lot from George Martin, if anything. The production, we really listen to it. Um, you can hear bongos and things on the, you know, and it made, made, made us listen to the Beatles music with sort of fresh ears, if you like, because, you know, you, you hear it on one level, but then if you start to hear it where you're analysing it, you can hear all sorts of other stuff going on. So, uh, Jagger was talking about the Ruddles as the Beatles. That's why he was so serious. <laughs> and he did that whole thing about going and selling any old song and all this. I think it was, it was verbatim, wasn't it? Jonathan? Yes, it's, very, it's quite interesting because we, we did that almost before, we, we, it was so before we went back to England to shoot the whole show. We did these interviews yeah. in New York. So they're the first things we did. And um, I remember going to Mick and he said, what shall I do? And I said, just play Mick Jagger. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And, uh, and so it, I think that uh, I found subsequently interviewing a lot of people about the Ruttles is they tend to reveal more than they would if you asked them about the Beatles. <laughs> I found that particularly on the second one where I've interviewed a lot more people that they actually tell very intimate and rather sometimes very moving stories under the guise of talking about the Ruttles. And uh, Dirk isn't that popular, it turns out. <laughs> There's a, a comedian around called Rod Hull, and he had this, this emu thing, which is a, a bird, you know? And the thing was, um, th th there is a point to this, and it isn't just jet lag, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, when you've got something like that, you can do all sorts of whatever <laughs> things that you wouldn't do normally. You see? But I did, never mind. But, but if you've got a character to be, to be um, pretending, one you admire, brackets, especially in the music business. <laughs>